I am so thankful to be back here talking about Joy Unstoppable. And I am convinced that God has each of us here for a purpose this morning. I am thoroughly convinced that he wants to radically change our hearts and radically change our minds. And if we're all honest, we have certain ways of functioning, certain ways of going through life, and certain ways of making decisions, and we don't really even think much about what's motivating us. We don't think much about why do we do what we do. And if we really begin to kind of examine, if we even right now think back over this past week, why did I make the decisions I made? Um, if we're honest, myself included, quite often it is for our own comfort that we make our decisions. Uh, we were at a end of the school year picnic at my son's school on Friday, and after lunch had been served, my wife and a friend of ours named Dylan, the two of them went around with bowls. And in Dylan's bowl, there were potato chips. And in my wife's bowl, there were carrots. <laughs> and a majority of people took the potato chips because they're much more of a comfort food. And most of us go through life basing our decisions on what we think is best for ourselves or what our own comfort is. And as we look at this passage today in Philippians, we're going to see that Paul seems to have lost his mind. You, you go, okay, Paul, th what you're saying here does not make logical sense according to how we live our lives. And it is unreal um, that Paul says what he says and does what he does. But we know that God is at work in and through Paul, and we know that Paul has great joy, a joy that is unstoppable. And if we're to grow to be more like Paul, and Paul followed Jesus, um, we might want to learn from what Paul has to say. We might want to learn from what God is saying through Paul to the church in Philippi and to us. So we're going to be looking at a passage today that I call Advance the Gospel. There's two paragraphs that we're going to be looking at, and the common theme between both paragraphs is the reality that the gospel is going to be advanced no matter what. And the reason the gospel is going to be advanced is because God is faithful. And there is nothing that will stop the gospel from advancing and doing its life-transforming work. And I said that, you know what, I'm convinced that God wants to change our hearts, and I'm convinced that he wants to change our minds this morning. And the reason that I'm convinced is the same reason Paul is convinced. Last week, we looked at a key verse uh, Philippians 1, 6, and it says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is thoroughly convinced that God is going to continue to change our hearts and continue to change our minds because that is exactly what God said he is going to do. God is going to carry this out. So, Join with me. If you want to uh, either open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12, or you can flip your bulletin over to the back, and we've got the whole passage on there this morning, or you can look on the screen. So we have a lot of opportunities for you to look at the Word of God. Look at this very first verse. This, this baffles me. This drives me crazy. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Okay, so now this begs the question, what happened to Paul? Like, okay, nice, nice beginning here, Paul, but what happened to you? 
we have to remember what happened to him is he is in a Roman prison. And you'd go, okay, you're in prison. How does that advance the gospel? Are, is there something I'm missing here, Paul? Because when you go in prison, it looks on the surface like that's stopping the gospel. And the reality is it's not. He goes on to say in verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of my, impri- of my imprisonment, or that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, have, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul is going, this is awesome. I got arrested and thrown in prison And now I get to share the gospel with the prison guards. Most of us would not think that same thought. Most of us would go, oh, you know what? My church planting efforts are done. I'm locked in prison. That's the end. And Paul is going, that is not the end. That's an opportunity. We would look at that as a roadblock. Paul is going, you know what? No, God is is going to carry out his redemptive mission in this world through us as followers of Jesus Christ, no matter what our circumstances look like. And a lot of us base our life on our circumstances. Paul is not basing his life on circumstances that he is facing. If he based his life on his own comfort or on his own circumstances, he would write a much different letter. He would say, oh, well... Kind of bummed, I'm locked up. Seems like God's not at work anymore. Seems like, you know, you're going to have to carry out the mission without me. But Paul says, you know what? God knew that I would be imprisoned, and God orchestrated that I'd be imprisoned so that these prison guards would come to know Jesus, and so that the brothers that are preaching the gospel would become more bold. Now, Verse, 13, or verse 14 says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Okay, so that also does not make sense. Think about this. If Paul is thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, would you want to be caught preaching the gospel and potentially thrown in prison? No. Paul, you know, look at you look at Paul and you go, okay, Paul, either you're a few fries short of a happy meal or or you're 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 understanding following Jesus in a radically different way than we do. And I believe that Paul finds his joy in Jesus, not in his circumstance. And he looks at this and says, you know what? Even the people the other brothers in Christ that are preaching and proclaiming the gospel, they're becoming not fearful, but more bold. And they're preaching the word without fear. They're preaching the word because they see that it is God doing his work through them and that no matter what our circumstances look like, our joy is intact. So Paul there, there are other um, passages in Scripture that refer to Paul and Silas singing hymns and praises to God. They're in prison, and they're singing. What kind of people do that? That's crazy. But that should be the kind of people we are. That should be the kind of people. We could look at a circumstance and go, you know what? No matter what my circumstances are, God is going to faithfully do his work through me. Now, I have a friend, and her name is Tanya, and she has suffered for over 10 years with an internal bleeding disorder that most doctors cannot figure out what's going on, and there still is no solution. She ends up in the ER about every three weeks and has for about 10 years. Uh, she has, has been, some, some years she's in the hospital more than she's at home. And you would go, okay, that circumstance, that sucks. 
That's awful. That is not a good thing. And she said, you know what? Maybe I am the only one that these nurses and doctors will ever hear the gospel from. She looks at her life and says, you know what? Thanks be to God that I have this rare disorder that no one can figure out because I get to see more doctors. Most of us would not be thinking like Tanya. But Tanya has learned the secret of Paul. Tanya has learned to live this way, saying, you know what? My life is not based on my own comfort and my own circumstances. My life is based on what God wants to do through me. And he might even use what looks like it's meant for evil. He might use it for good. And that reminds me of Romans um, 8.28. And we know that, that those who love God, um, for, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. When we're called according to God's purpose, God works even what looks like the most evil thing in our life. He works it for good. And we have no way of figuring that out. We run from things that are uncomfortable. But we should start looking at them in a different light and saying, God, you know what? When I encounter difficulty in my life, give me your eyes. Give me your heart. Transform my heart. Transform my mind by the power of your word so that I see what you're doing in my difficulty. Now I know many of you in this room right now, and I'm getting to know you more and more, and I, as I get to know you, I see there are difficulties in your life. And as people, when we face those difficulties, we tend to run away. We tend to either run or deny or ignore difficulty and what I'm saying today is that God may be using the most difficult part of your life where you go, I have no clue why God would allow this. He might be allowing it for your good and for his glory. He may want to use you as his ambassador to advance the gospel. He may want to do that in and through you. Think about that for a minute. I'm hoping that our minds are recalibrating that. We're not going to go and make decisions and live life based on our comfort or our own, our own wants, our own needs, our own desires, but that we, we begin to say, oh, what is it that God could be doing here? What is it that God is doing in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my struggle, in the midst of my hardship? What is it that God is doing and may that draw me closer to God, and may God work through me to be a vessel to proclaim his good news. Not only that, um, this first paragraph that we just kind of looked at is more of an internal uh, struggle. It's more of an internal hardship or suffering that Paul is going through. He's in prison. That's a very personal thing for him. He said, I'm in prison, and I'm I don't know what your prison is, but most of us are in prison to something or someone. I want to encourage you that God is with you in that. That God knows what you're going through. He is not missing it. He cares a great deal about you. Whether that difficulty is maybe in relationships, it might be your physical health, it might be your finances, it might be the family that he has placed you in, and you might go, you know what, God, you picked the wrong family to put me in. Or God, you picked the wrong job. My boss, oh, I don't know if I can last another day. Think about it. Hit the pause button long enough to go, okay, what is God doing here? But not only do we face internal hardships and internal struggles like Paul did, we face opposition. There's struggles of other people towards us. And Paul addresses that in this next um, paragraph. He says, um, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. 
The former proclaimed Christ out of rivalry, not, sincere, not sincerely, but thinking, um, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Okay, there are some strong words in this. It says, some indeed preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. So some people are preaching Christ, some of these brothers of Paul are preaching Christ with selfish motives. And he says, you know what? Yeah, some are going to preach with selfish motives, and some are going to preach from pure love. And Paul is rejoicing in both. And you go, okay, is Paul being soft on theology here? Is he being soft where he should be a bit more firm? Well, first of all, he is calling them out. He is saying that they're doing this out of, um, out of envy and rivalry, and he's saying that this is out of a selfish ambition. But he is excited because no matter what, the gospel is going out. The gospel is being proclaimed. And if we only wait for people with perfect theology done perfectly every single time, well, then none of us will ever be able to preach the gospel because we're all broken. And we all have misguided motives. And we all um, have some selfish ambition involved even in proclaiming the gospel. Now, Paul is demonstrating to the church in, in uh, Philippi the idea of extending grace to people that don't do things right. He's saying there are people that do things with wrong motives, and there are people that do things with right motives. There are people that do it out of selfishness, and there are people that proclaim and advance the gospel out of love. I wish that it was always out of love, but we know that People, as people, we are fallible. And so we will fail. We will do things out of selfish ambition. But Paul is, is saying, okay, if you have the wrong attitude, but you're preaching the correct gospel, I can bear up with that. I can understand that. I can extend grace to that. But in the book of Galatians, there is someone that is there are people that are preaching something that is not the good news, that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this passage, in Galatians, it says that I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, let him be accursed. So here he's using some strong languages, strong language. He's using the word accursed. It's preaching a curse onto people that are preaching a wrong gospel. That is vastly different than preaching the correct gospel out of a wrong motive. We're always going to preach things out of some selfish motives at times as we go out into the world. Do we want people to come to know Christ and will we feel good about that? Yeah. So Paul is saying, the goal here is that the gospel is being advanced. The gospel is going out. And in that, he finds great joy, or he is rejoicing. So as the gospel goes out, Paul is filled with joy, joy upon joy. And there is absolutely nothing that can stop the gospel advancing work of God. Think about this. For thousands of years, Satan has been trying to stop God's gospel advancing work, God's redeeming work in and through his church. Satan has been trying to put a stop, and every time that Satan tries to put a stop to it, God uses what Satan intended for evil, God uses for good. 
God is outsmarting Satan at every turn. There is no way that the gospel will be defeated. And Paul is finding great joy in this. Notice that Paul did not say, wow, I am finding great joy in my circumstance. This prison, you should come visit. It is amazing. He said, this is like a spa. He, that's not what he said. He's saying, you know what? I am rejoicing because the gospel is going forward. And may, that, may we all look like Paul as we grow as followers of Christ. May we have that same attitude in our hearts that no matter what we encounter on a daily basis, no matter what our circumstances are, may God use even the most difficult circumstances we face, may God use that for good. And I'm hoping that we can retrain our brains. Paul continually hits the same gong, hits the same note of, you know what, I, I can count it all joy, brothers, when he endures trials of many kinds. Just like in the book of James, um, when James is writing, he says, I can count it all joy, my brothers, when, you, when he endures trials of many kinds because of what that produces. What James is saying and what Paul is saying and what Peter says are some of the same concepts, some of the same notes. Next week, we're going to also be looking at, at Paul when he says, for me to live is Christ and for, for me to die is gain. Which, to the prison guards around him, he's, they're going, okay, how can we make this guy suffer? If we kill him, he gets to go be with his Jesus. And if we let him live, he's just going to keep telling us about Jesus. And if we let him go free, he's going to plant churches. And if we confine him, he's going to just tell whoever we put in his path more and more and more about Jesus. So what would it look like if each of us, as individual followers of Christ, and collectively as a church called Lakeside, what would it look like if we started having the same attitude that Paul has, this win-win attitude? If you kill me, that's awesome. If you let me live, that's for your glory. You know, it, it's, it's good no matter what you do. And Paul, when he is, is talking about the gospel being advanced, that is his primary joy is when he sees people encounter Jesus and the grace-filled gospel and their heart is forever changed, he's saying, you know what, that is awesome. Even if that means I have to go through hardship, even if that means that I'm imprisoned and people come to know Christ as a result of my imprisonment, awesome. And my prayer this whole past week has been that that, we, we can adopt that attitude, that we can adopt this attitude and that our joy would be a joy that is unstoppable because our joy is not linked to our circumstances. Our joy is not, is not selfish in its nature, but our joy is saying, you know what, God, I want what you want, even if that means suffering for me. And you may say, you know what, but I don't like to suffer, Tim. You know what, I'll be honest with you guys. I don't like to suffer, and I don't like to admit, but every time that I have grown to become more like Christ, it has been through suffering. It's never been through the beautiful moments. It has been through going, you know what, God, I am at the end of myself. I can't go on apart from you. And he's going, yes. That's the point. It's not you living for me. It's me living through you. And my hope and prayer is that God would, would wreck us by his grace, that he would demonstrate his love to us as we go through suffering. Uh, John Piper is quoted as saying, when things don't go the way they should, God always makes them turn out for good. When things don't go the way they should, God always makes them turn out for good. God is 
far beyond our understanding and far beyond our ability to comprehend what it is that he is doing. Not only a recent uh, theologian, John Piper, was thinking about these thoughts, but 441 years ago, uh, Sir Francis Drake in 1577, this is a long time ago, um, he wrote these words as a prayer to God. He said, Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we've dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we've sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with our abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the water of life. Having fallen in love with life, we cease to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of a new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on more wider seas, where storms will show us your majesty. We're losing sight of the land, we will find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizon of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Sir Francis Drake wrote this in response to the passage that we're looking at this morning. He's saying, you know what? Disturb us. Cause us not to get comfortable. And in our country, most of us live for our own comfort. And I'm praying that every single... I, I hope it's okay. I've been praying that we're, we, we would become disturbed this morning. That something would be unsettled in us. That we would go, you know what? Life is not about me. Life is about our great God doing his work in and through us. That what he wants to do is so much greater than I could ever do for him. So I know this is a bit dangerous, but I'm going to continue to pray this coming week that we would be disturbed by the grace of God, that we would be shaken up, that we would be uh, turned upside down like Paul, that we would be able to say, you know what, I'm in prison. Praise God. This is awesome. I get to share the gospel with my prison guards. I don't know what opportunities God is going to give you, but I want you to understand that the opportunities he, he, he's going to give you to proclaim his good news might not be gift-wrapped looking like an opportunity. It might look like suffering. Don't run away from it. Run to that. And trust that God has you in the midst of whatever that is. So I'm going to close in prayer. Oh, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you would disturb us in a good way. Lord, help us realize that you are at work in and through us, your church. Lord, you have given us all that we need to grow in our dependence on you. But Lord, when we grow self-reliant, cause us to stumble. Help us to see that it is you that is at work in and through us. Lord, by your grace, transform our hearts, transform our minds. Help us see our suffering as opportunity. Help us see when others oppose us or do things out of wrong motives. Lord, um, though it is intended for evil, Lord, you will turn it for good. Lord, I pray right now that you would continue your work through Lakeside. And Lord, that you'd use even the darkest moments of our days as an opportunity to open our eyes. Lord, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for Paul. And Lord, may we consider it all joy when we endure trials of many kinds, like it says in James. And Lord, may we live for you and not ourselves. Lord, we pray all this in your mighty and holy name. Amen.